I V M. Much of international relations depends on ideas and concepts that originated in Europe and North America. The idea of the Westphalian world system, the mechanisms of power, the way states interact and relate to each other, even the concept of rationality. Think of the big thinkers in the international relations field. So much of the essential reading in IR has been written by white men. There are other people who are investigating how to transform this. Constructivism, for example, borrows heavily from history and sociology of each situation. Even in India, you have scholars investigating how the Arthashastra has shaped Indian strategy or about how Nehru's views were realist or idealist. But is it possible to have an Indian IR theory? How do themes of decolonization, race and caste influence our thinking on the subject? Can we have a decolonial lens to international relations? Welcome to States of Anarchy. I'm your host, Hamsani Hariharan. And every week on the podcast, I break down important topics in global affairs and foreign policy. These are complex questions and they need nuanced answers. And my guest for today is possibly the best person in the country to tackle them. Dr. Siddharth Malavarapu is a professor at the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies at Shiv Narad University. I will note that his views today are personal. Uh, Dr. Malavarapu has extensively published and contributed to journals and books on international relations and foreign policy. He's the author of Banning the Bomb, The Politics of Norm Creation, is the co-editor of International Relations, Perspectives for the Global South with B.S. Chimney, and two anthologies on international relations in India with Kanti Bajpai. He's also contributed chapters to a number of different books and journals. So we'll dive into the conversation with Siddharth after a short break. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week. Thank you so much to Cred, Siet, and Global Victoria. Without you guys, this thing would not be possible. So, on the note, Maru Kinayat gives us an overview of the potential Twitter ban in India. On this round is on me. Gauri Devi Deyal was joined by actor-producer Purna Jagannathan to talk about her career in Bollywood, Hollywood, and theater. She talks about the upcoming season of the show, Never Have I Ever. On Cyrus Says, we had legendary musician Usha Uttop. She took us through her journey and shared her experiences as the unconventional musician. In the second installment of the Father's Day special on Akla Station Adulthood, Ayushi has a candid conversation with her father, Siddhartha Amin. On the Global Victoria Tech Talks podcast, we showcase some compelling new tech stories coming out of Melbourne. Whether it's from the buzzing gaming industry or the robust edtech sector, Victoria is increasingly becoming a hub of emerging technology. And we talk to some thought leaders and industry legends about the same. Catch all the action from the World Test Championship on the Edges and Sledges podcast. For our Hindi listeners, we have Kail Nidhi, which goes live on YouTube every morning. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Hi, Siddharth. Welcome to State of Anarchy. I'm so glad we finally got to do this after all the trouble that we both went through uh, to get down to this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. All right, let's get down to it. Um, whenever we think about studying international relations or IR, our essential reading lists are often old white men. Um, and so I think a lot of times when we look at these theories, there are, of course, criticisms about um, how they're sort of perpetuating existing stereotypes and how they might not be painting an accurate picture of the world. Um, and I think there has been an effort within India to sort of look back at our own history, at our own culture, at our own politics. So how have Indian traditions, how have Indian ways of thought influenced IR theory? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you that there's a tendency sometimes uh, to rely particularly on certain bodies of literature within the study of international relations. Uh, international relations as a field is notorious uh, for its Anglo-American ethnocentrism. And I don't think this is an accident. Uh, it has to do with the fact that the discipline is very closely linked to the fortunes of the major powers. Uh, so you had Pax Britannica, and you had at one point um, the United Kingdom, in a sense, determining the content of what really matters in international relations. Uh, subsequently, post-Second World War, you had the American ascent, uh, and you had, of course, a fair number of categories, concepts uh, emanating from that particular milieu. 
And some would argue uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens to China and Chinese international relations thinking as we go ahead, as also uh, rising powers uh, in some sense, uh, countries like India, other countries in the global south, and to see if that has an impact on knowledge systems. So fundamentally, I think we can ask this question about does material power really make a huge difference in terms of the manner in which we come to think about knowledge systems? Uh, and in the case of international relations, it clearly seems to be the case. So that's one element to bear in mind in terms of the backdrop. Second, I think, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get to this discussion about decolonizing knowledge systems, uh, I think, which is such an important project, because while at one plane you had the end of physical colonization, at another plane, you know, the whole project of knowledge systems and decolonizing these knowledge systems uh, is still largely incomplete. So here again, I think there is scope to think about different fields of study. Uh, it's not, again, restricted only to the study of international relations, but I would imagine a whole range of allied social sciences and humanities uh, also contend with this question of what it means to be decolonizing a particular area of inquiry. Coming back to India, I think you can think about different periods and the manner in which ideas have circulated uh, in this part of the world. If you think, of course, of the discipline of international relations and its institutionalization, quite clearly we seem to have followed more of the area studies project and model, which again is not a coincidence. It had to do with the American lineage uh, where you know, institutionalization of the discipline took place through these areas. Or so what we did was largely in the realm of South Asian studies. South Asia as a category defined it. Strategic commentators in this part of the world, for instance, prefer terms like Southern Asia, which also includes you know, other countries. So thinking about the institutionalization of the discipline, very often there has been a tendency for it to follow a particular trajectory. Uh, but in terms of thinking about our own traditions of knowledge, uh, some of these may not necessarily have been characterized as international relations in the modern North American sense of the term. Uh, but nevertheless, I think a, an old civilization state clearly gave consideration to a whole range of these questions, questions uh, even which one may treat as universal. You know, what is it to think about notions of justice, notions of political order, notions of legitimacy? Uh, but I think Terry Norden, the political philosopher, had an interesting uh, perspective he once brought to this whole issue, which when he said that there is also the point about different traditions, uh, you know, raising a set of questions which are also different. Uh, so I want to get back to this point about how context has a bearing on knowledge systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's important to understand from where we are located. So if you look, of course, at our recent um, you know, anti-colonization efforts um, and subsequently the emergence of the post-colonial state, uh, what you witness, of course, are a whole range of uh, fairly interesting figures wrestling with the idea of what it is for uh, a state which is, you know, in a sense, comes in into modern statehood uh, as a latecomer, but otherwise is actually a fairly old political entity. So how can we think about questions of political rule uh, in this context? How can we think about how we relate as a political entity with the world outside? Um, how do we bear in mind power differentials, uh, which are, uh, you know, are part of the, the furniture of the international system, uh, which we didn't really um, you know, entirely decide? <laughs> Uh, so these are the questions uh, countries wrestle with, and many post-colonial states have wrestled with these sorts of issues. So you could argue that there's a tradition, of course, of thinking about, uh, in the early years, it was referred to as third worldism, uh, where it was really thinking about, you know, our location in this part of the world, what it meant historically, culturally, politically, and how that also shaped our responses to the world outside. Of course, you have subsequently had traditions within foreign policy thinking. I'm thinking of non-alignment as a tradition. I'm thinking, of course, of the earlier period when you also had, you know, these um, Asian Relations Conference in 1946. You had Bandung in 1955. All of these were sensibilities which I think spoke to the larger anti-colonial world, which had now found, um, you know, new life as independent states. Uh, so there was clearly thinking around all of these questions. I've argued elsewhere that it's not always cast in the language of international relations theory, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think it raises a number of first order questions uh, about the relations uh, between different kinds of concepts, which we very often treat as central and germane to the study of international relations.
some scholars like to go back to an earlier period. Um, and uh, so, for instance, you know, uh, Kautilya very often is of interest to strategic commentators in India. Um, I would think that the epics are of interest to some scholars. Uh, I think Amrita Nalika has a book which looks at, um, you know, it's, I think it's titled Bargaining with the Rising India. And it looks at lessons from the Mahabharata. Amrita and Aruna Nalika, uh, you know, put together this volume. So there are people who are trying to recover these resources to also think about ways in which uh, we can imagine a conversation with, although it was set in a different context in time, it also has a resonance which might go a little beyond that. Now, there are two cautionary notes I would want to, uh, you know, quickly um, insert here. One, I think, first of all, I think there are a broad array of texts and archives, and we must be open to a variety of these texts and archives. We're still in the process of, uh, you know, poking and soaking, mm -hmm. uh, I think, at this stage. And it'll take a while before we get a sense of uh, what we've missed so far. And that's one element. And second, I think sometimes there's also, uh, one has to be cautious in the manner in which one, uh, you know, commits uh, sometimes some kind of a, what is referred to in the literature as a presentism, which is we read backwards uh, and uh, in order to just confirm a particular perspective we have uh, about the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, very often historians uh, quibble with international relations scholars because they feel we mine history very instrumentally uh, and selectively. Uh, which results in some blind spots uh, as far as our reading of history is concerned. Uh, but having said this, I think uh, the issue of traction, you know, how does the past weigh on the present, uh, is something uh, worth thinking about, uh, in, even in terms of ideational influences, the influences of ideas. I would also argue that there is no single quintessential Indian thought in that sense. I think what we have really are a variety of thinkers, a variety of texts, a variety of archives. And I think each of them speak uh, to many of these questions in their own medium. So it's interesting for us to be open to uh, not essentializing this particular reading of uh, even our past and its influences and how it manifests in the study of international relations, but being really open to uh, a wide variety of uh, influences in terms of how it shapes our thinking about specific questions. So I think, yeah, so some of these elements uh, would be part of, you know, the prehistory of Indian IR to think about ways in which uh, we can bring this into conversation with even conventional IR theory today. I think we should restrain from an anxiety to say, look, we have our own realists, look, we have our own constructivists. I mean, Kautilya precedes, you know, Morgenthau and Waltz by centuries. <laughs> so uh, I think there should be no anxiety to say, you know, look, we've had exactly something similar. We may have, in fact, I, uh, my sense is some of these figures are more complicated. And to label them into one or the other boxes of IR theory does some injustice uh, in the manner in which we uh, read and understand. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think uh, one of the reasons I sort of nested these under IR theory is because even though it borrows so much from everywhere, I, I still see it as important uh, in sort of shaping maybe policy decisions to a certain extent and also shaping the way we think about ourselves as a nation and as a country. Um, and so I think uh, within the IR space also, it's important to answer this. I'm wondering about a couple of things. One is I think it's very important that you mentioned sort of this confirmation bias that we all generally have when we look at history as sort of this linear timeline where things just happened one after the other rather than um, analyzing it for what it is, what's and all. The second that I would think about is actually sort of maybe uh, the way scholars in India have wanted to prove that their indigenous knowledge systems are old, are valid. And I think, you know, when George Tannum wrote his famous letter saying, oh, Indians don't have like a grand strategy, Indians don't have a history of political thought, it irked a lot of people. And that still remains within our scholarly circles to a certain extent. So um, there is a lot of saying, oh, India was, you know, uh, maybe particularly also depending on where you are on the political spectrum, there are a lot of people who say, oh, India was a great country before colonialism. And there are arguments about um, how Indian strategic thought in that sense has been continuous. There have been evidences of it. And 
I sometimes struggle to look at those because I think it's typefitting a narrative the same way we would say, oh, was Jawaharlal Nehru a realist or an idealist? I, I think, I, I just feel like typecasting a lot of these to say, no, we have our own indigenous knowledge production. It's sort of self-defeating at a certain level. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, so which is why I find uh, it interesting to recourse to the quest, take recourse to the question of context and to ask how do we view the world from where we are located? Uh, to me, that's an interesting question, you know, uh, and I don't think the world is a tabula rasa. It's not a clean slate. Uh, we view it through our filters of language, history, looking culture. Uh, I think there are all of these filters mediating uh, how we view the world and what we treat as uh, reality in some sense. Uh, so from that perspective, I think uh, I'm curious always to see how that works works out in terms of our manner of conceptualizing the world in particular sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's important. Uh, there is a tendency sometimes, of course, of these uh, you know grand theories to flatten out everything else. Uh, you know, so for instance, I think realists would argue uh, that power and interest uh, throughout human history, uh, repeated iterations of it is all what you see. Uh, but again, here, even power and interest and the detail of how it manifests in different periods of time uh, is of interest to historians, for instance, you know, uh, and they would argue that uh, such a reading of history is deeply ahistorical uh, and needs uh, to be corrected. So I think we need to uh, think about our own knowledge systems and what we treat as our own. But I think what we actually witness is that there have been a variety of global influences on even elements which we may regard as pristine and pure or indigenous. There is no such thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are influences from around the world. It's a world of global interdependencies. And what you actually, so for instance, those who uh, today advocate the writing of global history would argue that you can't write plain national histories. Uh, because it's a history of interconnections. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the historian Sanjay Subramanian calls it connected histories, mm -hmm. but there are a number of other terms which come to mind. But the idea here really is one of the flow of ideas, uh, the flow of capital, you know, the flow of other things, commodities, mm -hmm. uh, You know what A.G. Hopkins characterized globalization as, the flow of ideas, capital, commodities, and people mm -hmm. uh, across centuries. So historically, one can look back at that as well. And therefore, to me, all of these various elements are already in conversation with the world, uh, which is much larger. And that's what makes it interesting as well. Uh, and I would say this is true of other systems of thought in other parts of the world as well. Uh, they're also in conversation with uh, other elements uh, of thinking from other traditions and cultures. So all of this makes it, I think, interesting for us to be a little cautious about tracing lineages, itineraries of ideas. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, we tend to pigeonhole them too easily into one or the other readings. Uh, and that's a temptation which must be resisted. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So what would count as a balanced reading of various influences and how do we write those accounts uh, is something worth thinking about for uh, scholars in the field. Definitely. I agree with you. And I think there's a lot of new work that looks at this. I think Andrew Liu maybe wrote a history of capitalism looking at tea industries in India and China. And Sunil Amrit's uh, book on the Indian Ocean looks at sort of interconnected histories. And I think there is a lot of great new work that's being looked at how, as you said, the flow of uh, ideas and people and knowledge work, which brings me to something that we touched upon a little bit before, global patterns of knowledge circulation. We spoke already about how we can't look at something as purely indigenous. Um, how do you see um, this affecting the way that Indian IR is formulated in a sense? Yeah, I, I think one, of course, is we have to recognize that there's a, a fairly deep asymmetry in the production, distribution, and consumption of ideas. I think several scholars have uh, noted this asymmetry. It's also true of our field. Uh, sometimes there's a hierarchy of knowledge systems where theory is seen as produced largely in one habitus. Um, and, you know, uh, at best, what you can do is attempt to fit your empirics uh, to the reigning theory of the day. Uh, and so I think we've now reached a point when uh, we've recognized that these are problems in the manner in which uh, knowledge also has been constructed uh, in fields. 
so that's one element. And I like what the you know, Kenyan writer Gugi Thiango once said. Uh, and he said in the context of uh, literature, uh, he says uh, he's interested in this question, quote, the organization of literary space and the politics of knowing. To me, for me, uh, I've asked the same question in international relations. You know, what does it mean to think about how we are configuring knowledge within this field of study and what implications does it carry uh, for our politics of knowing in international relations? So I think getting back to this question of asymmetries, we need to think about ways in which uh, we can bridge some of these asymmetries. Uh, and I think beyond lament and critique, we also have to do the task, the hard task and hard work of offering uh, other archives and texts, uh, other readings, uh, other interpretations of universal questions sometimes, raising new questions. I think that work has to go on. And we have to create within our own systems as well the scope, uh, the institutional ecologies, which would allow for that actively and to encourage original thought uh, in these areas. So I think this is a process which will take some time. Uh, and I think we do have a generation of uh, very promising younger scholars uh, in the field uh, who are also thinking along these lines. And I, I see in the years to come that we would have at least addressed this asymmetry in a more frontal way and hopefully in a more productive and constructive fashion. And uh, since we spoke about um colonization before and sort of the power asymmetries, not power asymmetry, maybe the asymmetry in uh, knowledge productions. H- how does, I guess, like colonial, neo-colonial influences to work on such knowledge production? How does that translate? Okay. In several ways. I mean, one strand of uh, theoretical thinking I'm very uh, fond of uh, is TWAIL, which is referred to as third world approaches to international law. Uh, It's an interesting collective of international law scholars. uh, And one of the arguments they make very often is it's important to be attentive to historical continuities. Um, And very often um, the question of imperial continuities uh, interests them. Uh, And what uh, what is important about this particular collective and this particular project is that it's very often focused on very concrete empirical questions. So let's look at, for instance, R2P, responsibility to protect as a doctrine and its practice. Let's look at questions of the histories of humanitarian intervention. Let's look at the refugee question. Uh, Let's look at world trade, international trade. Uh, So when you anchor it in specific problems and questions, I think you see the workings, uh, the continued workings of uh, the residues of history uh, in the manner in which, uh, you know, things unfolded. So for instance, uh, even with regard to League of Nations and subsequently United Nations, a lot of scholarship has shown that ideas like trusteeship Mm -hmm. are are hugely problematic. Figures have been problematized. So Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, and his sort of, uh, you know, liberal idealist view has also been shown to have had racist overtones. Um, Churchill uh, has been also hugely problematized from a variety of perspectives. So I think what we are beginning to see is uh, this effort now to, to restore and rehabilitate, uh, if I could use that word, um, even disciplines which have been somewhat uh, over time uh, in the earlier phases, uh, somewhat oblivious or not sufficiently willing to acknowledge you know, historical wrongdoing in some of these areas. So I think that scholarship is doing a very useful service in making evident how these continuities, uh, these imperial continuities persist even in the modern world. So that offers you one possible way of thinking about these questions. I'm not saying, suggesting that it's the only way, uh, it's one conduit. Uh, I think there are scholars in the field also beginning to look at a whole range of other questions, uh, whether it's race or class or gender or closer home. We know uh, there's an interest in questions of caste and its workings. So I think all of this augurs for some kind of rehabilitation of knowledge systems as well over time. Uh, and it augurs well for that rehabilitation. Yeah. I'm just curious, how do you see that sort of rehabilitation playing out? Would there be sort of a change in funding structures? Would there be, like, how does that play out concretely when we want to say, okay, we want to reimagine some of these um, questions by using different lenses, uh, particularly as you mentioned, caste in India? How can that happen? Yeah, I think the rehabilitation uh, project is something which will take place at many levels. 
so one, we've been talking about the institutional ecology uh, and the asymmetry in institutional ecology. So thinking about you know, competent journals for younger scholars to publish in, um, modes of dissemination of ideas emerging from uh, less privileged parts of the world, uh, a focus on neglected areas uh, within this part of, of the world, which uh, we sometimes refer to as the global south. Uh, all of this is, I think, you know, the beginning of one making a claim on that term international. Uh, what does the term international really look at? Uh, is it merely a euphemism for major powers of the day, uh, or does it have a life which goes beyond that? Amitabh Acharya and other scholars have been asking the question about a global international relations and what a global IR should should be and should look like. So there's interest in that particular dimension as well. Uh, and I mean, returning to this question also, uh, I mean, very recently, uh, I just reviewed a book, a very fine book by T.C.A. Raghavan and Vivek Mishra on uh, you know, the Indian Council of World Affairs. Mm. Um, and one of the points I make there is that, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at the first generation of scholarship. Um, I mean, they were, many of them, um, I think, were very committed to the field and offered some interesting ways of thinking about it. But if you look at it, it's predominantly upper caste and male. <laughs> uh, so uh, what does that mean in terms of skewing uh, the manner in which a discipline unfolds over time? is something disciplinary historians of, of a particular field of study tend to be interested in. So I think what we will witness is once all of this, you know, these studies begin to surface, we will have a better sense uh, of various, like I said, various elements of that rehabilitation, you know, the set of rehabilitation dimensions which might need addressing and which we might see over time uh, actually finding its way uh, in thinking about disciplines being more democratic, disciplines being more open-minded when it comes to uh, chronicling accounts of people who've been neglected, um, chronicling account of cases which have been neglected, because there has been an obsession with great powers, uh, with major powers, hegemons. Uh, I think some of that work will anyway continue, but I think there is so much else to be told besides, besides that. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, I was just thinking about this as you were speaking, but there was this essay in the last week uh, written by Narayani Basu about uh, the first Indian female, uh, Indian Foreign Service officer. And uh, it was a wonderful <laughs> account. And, and it was very lovely to read it in popular media and so many people sort of just learning and understanding more about it. And I think that sort of slowly paves the way for, I guess, more people to become aware and sort of nudge that sort of rehabilitation process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's interesting work. I think Priya Satya's book, uh, which I'm reading now, Time's Monster, mm -hmm. um, does a wonderful job of it in the field of history, uh, where it asks this question about how history was complicit uh, with various uh, elements of empire uh, and uh, how the idea of conscience uh, in history telling was, was used with good effect to, in a sense, not really blame the colonizer for wrongdoing. So, you know, the whole notion of good intentions mm. was used to effect uh, and as a justificatory rationale for their actions, when in reality we know that the history of colonialism was, you know, anything but well-intentioned in that sense. Yeah, so I think there is, uh, we'll see more of this, I suspect, in other fields of study as well. Uh, some of this work is already going on in other fields and inquiry. And it's about time that international relations also, you know, uh, is sensitive to these concerns. Uh, and uh, it'll make us, I think, a more inclusive, you know, knowledge construct at the end of the day. Uh, I also think of gender questions. I think of class issues. These will also figure, I think, increasingly uh, more prominently uh, in the manner in which we relate and understand the world, as they should. As they should. And on that note, we'll just take a quick break and we'll come back. We live in an age of disruption, of immense change in every aspect of work, life and business. But is the old way of doing things truly dead? And are we ever going to stop saying the new normal? Join me, Varun Dugirala, on Advertising is Dead every Tuesday as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders, creators and change makers from across business, media, marketing and beyond to dig a little deeper into how we got here, what we're doing now and where we're headed. You can catch all the episodes of Advertising is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app or wherever you get your podcast from. Welcome back to States of Anarchy and I'm talking to Dr. Siddharth Malabarapu about 
decolonizing international relations, among other things. Um, we spoke a little bit about sort of the problems in um, formulating uh, IR theory, particularly uh, considering how global knowledge uh, systems work. When it comes to Indian IR, what do you see are the major problems in sort of formulating theory? Why haven't we been able to theorize Indian IR? Right. Um, I think one, of course, is uh, I think theorizing anywhere in any part of the world throws up its own complexities. Um, and uh, I don't think any single theory, uh, to be honest, uh, even in international relations, uh, even coming from the uh, Anglo-American world, uh, for that matter, uh, does justice uh, to the complexity of the world uh, we find ourselves in. Uh, so I think there are many ways to think about the theory problem and the theory question. Um, and uh, I mean, one way, of course, uh, you know, scholars like Gopal Guru uh, have talked about it is to sort of think about experience uh, in this part of the world as a basis for theorizing. Uh, of course, I think this is also bring us back to the caste element, which is, you know, uh, how does a certain experience, uh, you know, shape uh, our reading of the world? And what sensibilities can we introduce, uh, uh, which have not so far been, you know, uh, sufficiently acknowledged uh, or fairly acknowledged? Uh, so that's one aspect to think about the theory question. The other, of course, is sometimes to think about, you know, breaking our questions into more manageable morsels. <laughs> and not uh, you know, aiming at uh, grand theory. So I think grand, there's generally, I, I would believe, more skepticism about grand theory uh, globally and for good reasons. And I, I, so some would argue, I think uh, TV Paul, among others, uh, in, in one of these events we had where we were discussing ways of theorizing, well, politics suggested that middle range theorizing might be a good idea, for instance, that we sort of think about more modest areas where you identify clearly uh, two variables, think about their correlation, causation, uh, you know, see how it works in particular contexts, uh, and then slowly use that as a basis incrementally uh, to cover more ground uh, and, uh, and build knowledge uh, more systematically in certain areas, uh, which is one possible way of thinking about it. But I want to argue here that there are two elements here. One, I think, focusing on local empirics. Uh, is very important. Uh, and for us, uh, focusing on lo local empirics, along with the connections it has to the global, uh, would be interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one aspect and way of perhaps thinking about uh, how we could organize knowledge uh, around specific questions. The other aspect, uh, I think we may have also to go a little beyond theory testing, mm -hmm. uh, which we very often do. Uh, I think theory testing is not a bad place to begin uh, because you could argue by the end of it sometimes that the theory uh, is a poor fit uh, to explain a particular reality in this part of the world. But then from there, you have to ask the logical next question, which is uh, what might be a better way of explaining uh, what we don't seem to understand through this particular theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. uh, so there again, I think uh, we have to be open to that possibility uh, and be willing to think about not just theory testing, but actually theory creation mm -hmm. at some level. Uh, and I think this, this is bound to happen at some point as scholars get more confident uh, about uh, the decolonization project. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, uh, if at some stage, uh, you know, there is a sense that we should not be overawed by knowledge systems merely because they emanate from a certain context. Uh, then you're also willing to ask the question, uh, you know, okay, I know, I have a sense of my empirics mm -hmm. and I should have a fairly good grasp and a robust sense of the empirics I'm contending with. Now, how does this, uh, how does, how can I make theory speak to this empirics mm -hmm. uh, in intelligible ways um, and in, in, plausible ways. Uh, and I'm not saying that we need to compromise at all on social science rigor uh, we bring to those projects. Some would argue that science is a, is a problematic term because it privileges a certain epistemology, it privileges a certain standing and status, and it could also disqualify some other forms of knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. which we need to be cautious about. But more generally, I'm talking about a certain approach of mind uh, to systematically and rigorously follow up 
on leads um, and to start making those connections. Because what is theory at the end of the day, it's ultimately you're trying to discern certain patterns of behavior as well. Um, I think it was Rosina who asked this question, you know, so uh, yeah, what is this an instance of? Uh, that's the question you ask in theory. What is this an instance of? <laughs> uh, so that's one particular way of looking at and posing that question. But sometimes, you know, there's also this tension very often between the ideographic and the nomothetic, which mm -hmm. is uh, the general, uh, you know, ideographic is more context rich, specific. So an area study scholar could say that there's nothing in the world which compares to what I saw in Indonesia on this particular dimension. Uh, and there would be the theorists who'd say, you know, no, I think this theory should broadly work uh, if you apply it systematically mm -hmm. to the Indonesian context. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's more, the, the temptation in theory is to have more general formulations. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ideographic uh, scholar is pivoted on, you know, the richness of texture and detail uh, of that specific historical moment. Uh, and sometimes would be cautious about these generalizations, which they find, uh, you know, actually some, in some cases fairly repulsive because they feel it, it flattens out uh, the richness of a particular social episode or a political moment. The other element is to think about the idea of contingency in theory, which is uh, what are the mix of elements which produce a particular political outcome? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, it brings us back, of course, to questions of empirics and specific contexts um, and you know, uh, a richer and thicker sense of both history and the cultural milieu around which uh, some of these questions are being thought about. Uh, but it's, it's again worth thinking about what is contingent and what do these contingent configurations seem to throw up? Mm -hmm. And can we theorize them um, independent of what <laughs> uh, some of the other formulations which are competing for our attention uh, mm -hmm. look like? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, yeah, these thought experiments are possible, definitely. Uh, and I think they, some of them may yield some interesting answers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it also makes me wonder, I think there are other um fields in india that have that do well with theory creation when you think about like philosophy or literature these fields do especially well um with, with sort of working um through decolonial lenses and other lenses also is there i, I don't know if it's just sort of my lack of knowledge on the subject but is there a reason why indian ir doesn't seem to borrow from these fields within the country is it just that it's closed or am i uh, or is it just that I don't know enough about sort of the way that the reformation works? Yeah, no, I think uh, in part you're uh, absolutely right about uh, a somewhat sometimes uh, a slight distance and aversion to uh, social science more generally, I would say, uh, you know, uh, and it has to do with the policy reflexes of the field. Uh, and this is something which uh, other chroniclers, disciplinary historians have pointed out, which is that there is the policy science dimension of international relations. So one, I think it tends to be pivoted in terms of topicality and, you know, it's it's a very uh, immediate temporality. Uh, it's, so it's not really focused on, on, sometimes there is a sense that it's not long duree, it's not uh, really taking into account of, of secular influences over time in history. Uh, so that's one dimension, uh, I think, which is, uh, you know, responsible for some of that. I think we talked about the ahistoricism of realism earlier, mm -hmm. political realism. Uh, and uh, there again, there's a temptation to have a broad brush reading uh, of, uh, you know, uh, human existence. So there again, the issues, some would argue that our assumptions also increasingly are homo economicus, mm -hmm. rational human being assumptions are also not adequately questioned. And therefore, some of the richness of you know, questions now, which more people are talking about, the role of emotions in politics, uh, the role of affect, um, you know, how do these shape uh, our political understanding? Uh, I think we're just beginning to, uh, you know, acquire some, um, some handle <laughs> over it. I think they were dismissed earlier because many of these things were not seen as amenable to measurement. Mm. Uh, but I think that's an unfair criticism because it doesn't mean that they don't matter <laughs> if they can't be measured. Uh, they still matter. Uh, so, uh, I think all of these dimensions are um, important when we're thinking about uh, these, uh, uh, the question of social sciences, the allied humanities, and the links to international relations. Although I would think now we have, again, I'm very hopeful uh, because I do see a number of 
uh, very fine minds, uh, you know, uh, engaging and taking an active interest, reading across uh, disciplines uh, and trying to sort of uh, sometimes bring elements of those thinking uh, back. I found it, in, personally, I found it very useful. Uh, I think this poet, uh, the poet Coleridge was once asked why he was sitting in a chemistry lecture. Uh, and he, they said, you're an English poet. What, are you, what have you got to do with chemistry? He said, uh, I'm looking for new metaphor. Uh, so uh, uh, so I think there is always this, um, you know, sometimes we get very important and interesting ideas also when we juxtapose different systems of thought. And if you look at it as questions, uh, I think many disciplines are wrestling with similar questions. You know? mm. So uh, I, as I mentioned, the broad rubric, we talked about decolonization. Mm. Uh, we opened with that remark saying that decolonization is not the, you know, is not the um, sort of concern of one specific discipline. It has a much larger life. Uh, so I think when you start thinking about it as questions of inquiry and you come from different tacks, different angles, uh, then it opens up uh, all of these fields of study. Uh, and I think nilly willy, there's no real escape from this. Uh, I, I think eventually, if you want to have a deeper engagement with good IR writing and scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, you will see more of this, uh, this turn to various social sciences and humanities. Mm. What is this an instant thought of that? <laughs> this is, uh, I think, has to do more generally with the fact that uh, these questions of decolonization uh, are percolating the consciousness of disciplines which uh, have been somewhat more resistant to it. I think it has partly to do with the fact that, as I said, I began by saying IR is linked to the fortunes of the major powers. In fact, Robert Vital is you know, a scholar who's written this really fine book, which looks at the manner in which the field evolved in the United States, uh, argues that IR really is an imperial science, uh, which was interested in the modalities of colonial management, even after the colonial project was over. Uh, of course, it was not going to take uh, the brute forms it took during colonial rule, uh, but the broader model of imperial management was something which, was, which came naturally uh, to the major powers when they looked at international relations as a particular field of inquiry. All right. And on that note, we'll take a super quick break and come right back. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us. Sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IBM app, website or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to States of Anarchy, and we are down to the last leg of our podcast episode today. Um, so that we've spoken so much about sort of decolonizing um, IR, and you've spoken about how you are hopeful for the field because of new young scholars who are exploring lenses. Um, I really want to get into the new lenses that exist within India today and how they've possibly come up. Caste is definitely one that you'd mentioned. So how do you see this sort of informing our inquiry about sort of uh, theory formulation? Okay, yeah. So I think there are uh, five or six elements I'll just briefly flag mm -hmm. uh, to give a sense of what I think are, uh, you know, possibilities which lie ahead. One, uh, I think, to sort of get back to the point about historical continuities, I think scholars, for instance, working on international organizations uh, within the field of international relations could do a good job by you know, casting this long historical glance uh, and using that as a basis to also understand how we've got to where we've got, how we've arrived at the place we are today. Uh, so that's one, uh, one dimension of it, which is to sort of go back to historical continuities, look at the weight of the past and the present, uh, examine the possibilities uh, sometimes uh, which seem fairly palpable and evident of variants of neocolonialism or neoimperialism, even when it comes to the resolution of contemporary questions. Second, I think I did mention this whole dimension of restoring lost texts and archives, you know. So, again, we have to create an alternative pantheon here, you know, which, uh, which brings to attention uh, figures we don't know. And here again, I think when I did mention the, you know, Kautilya, what I was also suggesting is that we shouldn't run the risk again of uh, having only one or two key figures uh, and, you know, loading them with all the burden of 
having to sort of uh, uh, explain the richness of political thinking in this part of the world. I think there is scope and there is possibility of examining archives more carefully, even going back to our recent anti-colonial nationalist history, a uh, possibility of throwing up interesting figures and beginning to fathom uh, how they contributed to a certain understanding of the world. Again, here, uh, you know, uh, my own mentor, Kanti Bajpai, and I are part of a project which is trying to do this with regard to India's internationalist and strategic thought, and is really looking at the anti-colonial nationalist archive more carefully uh, from this perspective. Uh, apart from this, I would think that we need to bring attention to neglected parts of the world, which means to say that even in the global south, sometimes we are pretty unaware of what is going on in a continent like Africa or uh, what is going on in the South American space. And clearly, we're missing out a lot, I think, in terms of ideas, in terms of figures, uh, in terms of specific experiences of navigating uh, the asymmetries of power as well. And here again, I think it calls for a certain degree of openness. Uh, it calls for creating networks of scholars and you know, building on a Southern sensibility or Southern sensibilities based on an exchange with scholars uh, from these various parts of the world. And then I think the other element which is important is to think about the whole question of marginality uh, and what it means in the world today. Uh, and here again, I think we've talked about caste, we talk about the Dalit experience uh, in the Indian context, or if you talk about indigenous peoples, uh, there's a lot of good scholarship uh, around indigenous peoples, particularly in the South American context. I think it's important uh, for us to start thinking about, uh, when, so when we say, uh, for instance, even within Twail scholarship, when they say third world, they're not talking about any geographical fixity. They're talking about it more broadly as a sensibility where we're talking about people who've been, uh, for various reasons, dispossessed and uh, find ways in which there is scope for bringing back and acknowledging more honestly, um, you know, how we can think about, you know, their sensibilities and how we can think about it within the scope of our existing disciplines uh, of uh, understanding the world, international relations being one of them. So I, I imagine this work goes on in several fields, but it's also perhaps for us important within the sphere of international relations to think about these questions. Uh, and I think, uh, most importantly, a rejection of an uncritical embrace of dominant ideas emerging for more privileged habitus. Uh, I think that's important. There is sometimes, you know, a tendency to merely take on an idea because it's come from a, from a fairly powerful setting. And I think there again, there is scope for us to more critically receive these ideas. I don't think we should at all uh, be nativist in our approach, which is to believe that everything here is is the be all and end all uh, at the best. Uh, I think we should believe in an active exchange of ideas, but it has to be an exchange which allows for a more equal encounter. And it also allows us to imbue the ideas of the world with our signatures, as well as to sort of process better what comes from other parts of the world when it you know, uh, influences elements of thought here. I think Walter Mignolo had an interesting term for this. He called it transculturation. Uh, which is that even ideas, when they travel, sometimes begin to change texture and tonality and form and begin to look different in different parts of the world. So I think that's, again, something which is probably be worth being alive to. And I see all of these elements in various ways being addressed by a diverse group of scholars, uh, even within the global south, which I feel is very encouraging. So uh, uh, that's, that's, my, that's a reason for optimism. No, I'm glad that there is a reason for optimism. But I do have a question. I often find that, you know, academic settings, academic lines of inquiry are a reflection. Or maybe after there is a certain time lag, but, the, but they are also a reflection of what is happening outside the academic sphere. And in the last couple of years, because of the rise of sort of populist, illiberal leaders... I also see sort of the tone of conversation changing. So you spoke a little bit about sort of the rejection of dominant ideologies, but perhaps what this sort of politics brings with it is the resurgence of these dominant ideologies in a sense. So do you see that also reflected in scholarship to a certain extent? Yeah, scholarship uh, is is not operating in a vacuum, as you very rightly put it. Uh, you know, we are in a world in which there are various elements uh, impinging on our thought. And I think we have to come clean on our, on our assumptions uh, when we also uh, offer our own thinking about the world and where we are coming from and how our own context is to an extent uh, impacting the way we think about the world. 
So that I think is important. Uh, but having said this, uh, I think it's important for us as academics uh, to find our own feet. And I think IR has been very often, I mean, this policy science reflects sometimes has resulted in a certain degree of conformism, you know, which is to sort of say, okay, you know, uh, I agree with what is it. And, you know, it can become at moments apologia for policy, which, uh, I mean, if, if one genuinely believes that it's the best course, uh, I think it's fine and one can make a strong case for it. Uh, but it's also a good, I think, if we are able to put on the table uh, a set of possibilities uh, of thinking about even fairly uh, traditional domains of inquiry, uh, foreign policy being one of them. Definitely. Um, all right. And that brings me to sort of the last question for today. Um, what are books or resources that you would recommend for anyone who is interested more in the field on decolonizing IR or on uh, global patterns of knowledge circulation? Okay. Um, I mean, the book which I really thought was very interesting was one by Brandon Gruffitt Jones. It's an edited volume. It's called Decolonizing International Relations. Uh, it's a good place for anybody to begin uh, a serious inquiry into what this might mean. Uh, it has several idioms in which it considers decolonization and has some very fine contributors. I mentioned Robert Whitehouse a little while back. His book, White World Order, Black Power Politics, The Birth of American International Relations is worth thinking about and reading. Uh, it's, a, it's an important and interesting book. I would think Nicholas Geilo, uh, a scholar, has an interesting piece titled Imperial Realism, Post-War International Relations Theory and Decolonization. Uh, again, a good place to go. In the Indian context, uh, you know, I, along with uh, my mentor, Kanti Bajpai, we co-edited a couple of volumes. But the idea was really to sort of suggest that there is theoretical thinking within the Indian international relations scholarly community. Uh, and the effort was really to bring together a set of contributions along these lines. So I would mention our first volume was titled International Relations in India, Bringing Theory Back Home. The second volume was titled International Relations in India, Theorizing the Region and Nation. Uh, also, uh, you know, I had the opportunity with the Twail scholar B.S. Chimney to put together a volume titled International Relations Perspectives for the Global South, uh, which again was an effort to really... Uh, offer an alternative menu of even topics uh, which one would encounter in a conventional IR textbook. So how many IR textbooks have an entry on imperialism or colonialism for that matter? So part of the effort here was really to bring that back into focus in some fashion uh, within the field. Uh, I think Amitav Acharya and Barry Buzan's book, The Making of Global International Relations, Origins and Evolution of IR at its Centenary, uh, offers, again, a fairly interesting account, uh, a fairly broad brush account, again, of this history, which I think is worth engaging with. So these are just some illustrations I could go on for a while about uh, what are the other possible readings. But I think some of these books will lead you on to a number of other sources uh, through their footnotes, through their bibliographies. Uh, you can actually assemble a good working inventory uh, of uh, thoughtful international relations, hopefully. Thank you, Siddharth. Yeah, that sounds like a great starting point for thoughtful international relations. Uh, on that note, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, it's good to see a podcast of this kind focusing on these questions. Uh, so congratulations for all the good work. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of States of Anarchy. All of Siddharth's recommendations are in the episode bio, so do check them out. Just a reminder that every fortnight I do a special Q&A episode where I take listener questions on global affairs. So if you have a question about decolonization or if you have any comments or doubts, you can email me at ivmstatesofanarchy at gmail.com or get in touch on social media. On Instagram, my handle is at statesofanarchy and on Twitter, I'm at Hamsni Hitch. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, I'd love your support. Please share it with someone who may enjoy it or leave us a rating. If you're not following us on Instagram, you should. We post quizzes, videos and fun posts about the world. You can listen to States of Anarchy on any podcast app you use. Finally, remember that we're still living in a pandemic. It's good to stay safe. So mask up, get vaccinated and stay home. Sending you lots of good vibes. We'll be back next week. Working Monday to Friday glued to your chair making you feel dull? Worry not. Get your 5-minute weekly dose of travel around the world with postcards from nowhere. Join me every Thursday 
as I explore the strange, obscure and fascinating parts of the world and bring out facets of travel you may not have thought of before. You can find us on the IBM Podcast app, website or wherever you get your podcast from. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala, host of the Empowering Series podcast on the IBM Network. I happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession, and I'm here to share with you productivity tools, life-altering techniques, and real-life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do: your relationships, professions, careers. So tune in every Monday to unleash your inner power. Be safe. Be well, be empowered.